I think it is possible to isolate uh, the physical movements and to um, practice them in within a therapeutic context. And it came through the wall and rushed across the room and slammed into my forehead and began to try and suck my soul out of my body. And intuitively, I realized in a split second that was the demon I'd yielded to when I did Kundalini Yoga. Well, hello and welcome along to another edition of Unbelievable. And if you're watching here on YouTube, do make sure to like today's video, subscribe to the channel for more from Unbelievable, and you can get the weekly podcast and our newsletter by clicking on the info along with today's video. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Mike Shreve and Chris James to the show today. Should Christians practice yoga is what we're asking. Yoga is, of course, a phenomenally popular form of exercise and meditation across the whole of the West. Many a church hall is hired out for a local yoga group. But should Christians take part in yoga, given its links with New Age Eastern religion? Or can the spiritual dimension of yoga be separated from the physical exercise and the benefits that that brings? Uh, and how can Christians ultimately better reach out to those in the new age and meditation community? Well, to help us answer all these questions, I am joined by Mike Shreve and Chris James, who were both advanced yoga practitioners before their conversion to Christianity. Um, Mike's conversion experience in the early 70s actually led him to completely reject all forms of yoga. Uh, he founded Shreve Ministries and wrote the book, Seven Reasons I No Longer Practice Yoga. Uh, Chris James is a former yoga and meditation teacher. He came to faith more recently and we'll hear that story. But in the past, he's been voted actually as one of the top 10 yoga and meditation teachers in the UK and has trained under some of the leading yoga practitioners in the world. So although Chris no longer follows the spiritual path, as it were, of yoga, he still performs the exercises. He finds they continue to be helpful for his physical and mental health. And so I think uh, there'll be lots of points of agreement, also some points of disagreement between my two guests on the show today. So um, let me welcome you both, Mike and Chris. Welcome along to the show today. Well, it's great to be with you, Justin. It's great to be with you, Justin. It's great to have you both on. Um, before we get into your stories, which are both fascinating, um, and we need to spend a little time hearing them, uh, tell me first of all, uh, what is yoga? Consider me uh, uninitiated. All I know is I sometimes see pictures of people doing interesting moves, you know, in school halls or wherever, uh, village halls. What, what though, is is yoga tell me about its history tell me um what the modern forms of it involve especially in the west and and about some of the different you know traditions in yoga as well perhaps start with you mike to just give us a, a potted history of, of yoga first of all well it's impossible to trace it back to its absolute original root but it's uh, accepted that it started in the indus valley and that's where you get the word hindu uh, from the physical location of that group of people. And the word yoga actually comes from a Sanskrit word, yuj, which is spelled in English, Y-U-J. And it means to unite or to yoke. And so the implication, if you do yoga, is that you are uniting or yoking with the oversoul or universal consciousness. Uh, whether it's the lower physical aspect of yoga or the higher spiritual paths that some walk. Uh, it's all geared, it's all keyed to this goal of uniting with the absolute. And there are many different types of yoga. And I'll add this part and then uh, Chris can, I'm sure, add some other information. For instance, just to give a, a very brief overview, there's Hatha Yoga, which is the basic physical aspect of yoga. Karma yoga, which is the yoga of good deeds and sowing and reaping is what we would call it biblically, but it, that's different than the idea of karma mm. uh, in yeah. Hinduism. Then you have bhakti yoga, which is devotion to an individual God. Most Hindus believe that we as Christians are simply practicing bhakti yoga, but uh, of course I differ with that altogether. And mantra yoga is something I practice quite heavily, and that's the chanting of mantras in order to achieve this uh, God consciousness level, Christ consciousness, self-awareness, self-realization, 
they have a lot of words for it. Raja yoga is the royal path of yoga. It involves a lot of meditation. Uh, tantric yoga is uh, yoga that actually uses uh, sexuality in order to supposedly experience higher consciousness. And it goes into some very strange and uh, outlandish areas, I believe. And then the kind of yoga I practice was kundalini yoga. And of course, uh, the unique word there is kundalini. And kundalini means serpent power, which should have been a red flag to me right from the beginning, having been raised Catholic. I was raised in a nominal church, though I did not know Jesus. And uh, why do they call it kundalini? Why do they call it kundalini yoga? Because they conceptualize the idea that there is a... Uh, a source of energy at the base of the spine that is in a dormant state, coiled like a serpent, and that through the various uh, physical and spiritual and mental yogic exercises that you can awaken the kundalini, it will travel up through what they believe are energy centers called chakras, which I no longer believe in, but it travels up through the chakras to the third eye and the crown chakra, and that's when you merge with universal consciousness and become one with God. But uh, even though I experienced white light and I experienced that type of uh, intense supernatural experience, it was not the true experience of God. That did not happen until I encountered Jesus. Well, well we'll come to your story because uh, it is quite, quite an interesting and remarkable one. Um, Chris, um, anything to add to that description of yoga, both the, from the physical point of view and the spiritual beliefs often associated with yoga? And, and what form of yoga did you practice as well? Right. So um, I, I agree with pretty much uh, most of what Mike has, Mike has said. Um, I think I have a slightly different spin on it, but just slightly different. And uh, I have a, a slightly more historical and recent and westernized, I think, understanding of, of yoga. So first of all, um, I think we can trace back yoga a little more accurately into antiquity. Um, uh, archaeologically, there have been some recent excavations at Harappa in India, which just Harappa just sits in between uh, the Punjab and Delhi, where there have been um, temples and baths depicting um, figures in uh, seated yogic postures and using the hasta. Uh, mudras, that, uh, which are the seals, which are the hand gestures. And these temple friezes can actually be traced back to about uh, 3000 BCE. So um, there's also evidence that yoga was practiced not just in India, but it was also practiced um, by the Egyptians as well, and even by the Inca civilizations. So um, it just so happens that uh, the yoga traditions have been more faithfully recorded in India. Um, so if we jump forward 5,000 years, uh, much of the yoga that's now done in the West is um, the result of a diminutive Brahmin by the name of Krishnamacharya, uh, who was active um, right up to, uh, well, his dates were uh, 1888 to 1989. And um, he, um, basically went on uh, performance tours around India to try and garner interest in yoga, which kind of had fallen to the wayside in terms of popularity. And he was responsible for um, teaching people like Indira Devi, Patabi Joyce, BKS Iyengar, uh, TKV Deskachar, who are responsible for the many Western schools of yoga that are taught in your local uh, local um, centers and gyms etc and these forms of yoga really are focused more on the physical side of uh, of yoga or referred to as the asanas i think mainly to cater for the uh, western sensibilities and obsession with fitness and the body and the mind so that's the kind of um, the route that i'm familiar with although um, I, I i do know what what mike's talking about uh, with the more kind of vedantic uh, traditions, and I'm sure we've got a lot to speak about there. Um, another really uh, important development in the history of yoga is the um, the sutras of Patanjali, right. which was the first time, which was the first time really that uh, the yoga discipline 
was uh, recorded uh, in, in written form. And this took place uh, somewhere around um, uh, the turn of the um, uh, one, let's say 100 BCE, um, give or take a, a few hundred years either side. And what the yoga um, sutras of Patanjali are, are the, um, the kind of the foundational texts of classical yoga. Um, so it's a collection of 196 sutras or threads, which basically describe what this, um, you know, what this, what this yoga is. And um, out of those 195 or 196 sutras, um, there are just one or two sutras or threads that pertain to the physical practice of um, yoga. And all it says about it is that um, Asadam Sukham's theorem, which means that the pose must be soft and light and steadfast. So um, I think um, just to quickly um, um, uh, bring, bring this part of it to conversation to a close, um, the yoga sutras are best known for their uh, treatment of Astanga yoga, um, which is the Eightfold Path and, and Kriya yoga. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for, for those sort of different ways in which which obviously pe- people have engaged with yoga um, down millennia, uh, effectively. Uh, let, let's hear your stories now, because um, I, I always enjoy a good story. Um, Mike, tell us about your life um, in the, the late 60s and early 70s, because you were actually very much into sort of Eastern philosophy, New Age kind of ways of thinking, psychedelics, that kind of thing. But you had this very dramatic encounter with Christ that drew you out of that very suddenly. Tell us about that and, and why that led you completely in a different sort of way of, of looking at yoga from that point on. Well, I was a rock musician, Justin, and living that kind of lifestyle. And eventually it backfired because I had a, a near death experience where I felt my soul leaving my body and going out into this throbbing, dark void and it was speeding up at a tremendous rate of speed. And I knew I was transitioning from time to eternity, from this world to whatever was out in front of me. And it was very frightening to me because I'd never really made that a focus of attention in my life. And I realized when I came back from that terrible experience that I had to find answers. And I did not believe I could find answers in the traditional church I was raised in. And I met an Indian guru named Yogi Bhajan that headed this group called Kundalini Yoga. And I thought it's uh, worth giving up everything to pursue this. So I dropped out of college and began devoting myself completely to the study of yoga. And in our ashrams, various ashrams that we lived in, we had a very rigid discipline from 3.30 in the morning to 5.30 every night we would be in some type of yogic discipline, starting the day with mantra yoga and chanting, uh, and we may get into that more later on, uh, chanting various mantras in order to achieve higher consciousness or reach self-realization. And then I would do the asanas uh, for a couple of hours and read the Vedas, read the Bhagavad Gita, uh, read uh, books like Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda, and some of his other works. And uh, my whole day was consumed. I didn't do anything else but that. I never dated. I never went to entertainment venues. Uh, all I did was study. And then at night, we taught classes in various places. Well, at a certain point, I broke off from the main group and went to Tampa, Florida, and started teaching in four universities there and running a Kundalini Yoga ashram. And it was during that time that the Tampa Tribune newspaper did a big article on me. And I thought it would increase my class attendance. I didn't realize it would alert a Christian prayer group to start praying for me. And they (laughs) cut that article out of the paper, pinned it to the prayer board, and assigned somebody to be fasting and praying for me every hour of every day. And so I'm being soaked with intercession. And within about three weeks, these things started happening that had to be more than a coincidence. I got a letter Mm -hmm. from an old friend of mine. He and I had quit college to study under different gurus. And this letter was quite a surprise. 
He told me he had walked in a church and felt the Spirit of God fall on him. And he heard an audible voice say, Jesus is the only way. And the Spirit of God came into him as he acknowledged that as a reality. And, and, and he said he was born again. It was a very powerful encounter uh, that changed him altogether. And he said, Mike, you'll never find God through what you're doing. You have to go through Jesus. And immediately, I, in as much kindness as possible, responded to him negatively and said, no, I, I believe that's a lesser path to choose one religion and exclude all others. But his letter weighed on my mind. So one day I decided to dedicate an entire day to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was very gracious to confine himself to a 24-hour period that I had set. And I said, Lord, if you're really the Savior of the world, and if you really rose from the dead, and if you really died on a cross for the sins of humanity, give me a sign today, I pray. And all I did that day was read the Bible and pray to him. I didn't do any of my yogic disciplines. And that afternoon, I was hitchhiking to go teach a yoga class at University of South Florida. And I was still praying. As I stuck my hand out hitchhiking, I was still saying, Jesus, if you're the answer, show me. One of the members of the prayer group was two miles away. And he was walking in a laundromat with a handful of dirty clothes. And God spoke to him and said, don't go in there. Get back in your van and start driving. I've got a job for you to do, which was uh, quite surprising to him that God did not want him to do his dirty clothes. You know, why would God care? <laughs> and so he obediently, thankfully, got back in his van and started driving and turning whenever he felt an impulse. And he never picked up his hikers. That was a golden rule that he lived by, a cardinal rule. But when he saw me hitchhiking, he felt that compulsion again. So he pulled over. And there I'm still praying. And as I opened the door to his van, I looked in and my heart jumped. Because on the ceiling of his van was a picture of Jesus. And I knew this was not coincidence. It was a God incidence. And I was just waiting for something to be said. And a few minutes later, he said, friend, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He said, have you ever experienced Jesus coming into your heart? I said, no, but when can I? I'm ready. He said, you can come to a prayer meeting tonight. I said, I don't want to wait for a prayer meeting. I've been praying all day long. So he pulled the car over. And, and this is a little uh, part of the story I don't usually tell. But God was so gracious to work things out for him and for me. Because when he pulled the van over into a parking lot, it was right in front of a laundromat. <laughs> so he said, uh, I'll be back in just a minute. And he ran in and put his clothes in the washing machine and then came out and talked to me for about 30 minutes. And I said, I'm ready, man. And we knelt down in the back of the van and I prayed. I stumbled my way through a prayer that I thought was completely illogical. But I was willing to open my heart. I was a truth seeker. So I said, Lord Jesus, and it was full of ifs. If you died on the cross for me, I'll receive you into my heart. Wash me in your blood. If you can save me, then save my soul. And I receive by faith the gift of eternal life. And uh, I felt something very powerful happen internally. So strong and so undeniable that I went back to my yoga class with my newfound friend. He went with me and I announced to them, that I had discovered that I had misled them and that Jesus was the only way. And I was shutting all my classes down and shutting my ashram down and following him the rest of my life because I, I discovered that he was the way, the truth, and the life, like John 14, 6 says, no one can come to the Father but by him. Well, th what an extraordinary story. Um, Mike, we'll, we'll come into the additional reasons why you've ultimately, you know, believe that yoga is is not compatible with christianity um but but what what interesting story to kick us off with chris let's have your story now um t tell us about your life as a yoga instructor how you got into that um and and then you know what's happened in recent years to make you start to think about at least you know the way in which your faith engages with the practice of yoga yeah sure so um i was in i was in india uh, traveling through India and I, and I set up a business uh, buying textiles 
and I used to import the uh, textiles back to uh, back to the UK. And so I, I, I followed the sun for a few years. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that. And on one of my buying missions, buying textiles, um, I was introduced to yoga in a place called Rishikesh uh, in India. And uh, when I was traveling, I was always quite impressed with how um, you know, yoga practi- practitioners seem to be very passionate, seem to be very dedicated in their practice. And I thought, well, you know, when I when I'm next in in the in the area, I'll I'll I'll, I'll give it a go. So I did, and um, and it, it pretty much immediately, you know, I felt its its benefits, and um, um, then I suffered a really serious uh, neck injury in about the year 2000, um, and I, I broke my neck, uh, and um, I decided that. Um, uh, yoga had positively contributed to recovering from the uh, from the injury, and then I um, taught. Uh, then I uh, was certified under the British Wheel of Yoga, which is the regulatory board in the UK, uh, to teach. Um, I had my experience with um, yoga masters in India as well, which was very interesting, and my experience of uh, living in India as well, which was uh, an extraordinary experience. Um, I started off as a jobbing yoga teacher. I taught about 25 classes a week. Uh, I taught one-to-ones, workshops, etc. But I, I, I slowly over a period of time, um, I had been doing it for quite some time, I began to slowly really lose interest um, in, in yoga. And then in about 2015, although my story I don't think is quite as dramatic as Mike's, um, the, the the scales the scales very gently began to um, fall from my eyes, and I came to faith in uh, came to faith in Christ. And uh, let me tell you about a few of those things that happened to me along the way. There was no real in on the road to Emmaus experience. Um, so, for example, you know, with with, with Mike's experience, but it, it just ended up creating a complete paradigm shift in the way that. Um, I viewed uh, myself, the world, and uh, people around me. So I, I was living in Twickenham at the time. In fact, I was listen, uh, li- uh, living across the road from uh, the church, which um, I was very proud of the fact that I'd never stepped inside in the nine or <laughs> ten years um, that I that I'd been that I'd been living there. And I remember how on some Sunday mornings, when I used to come back to uh, my house where I lived. Um, back from clubbing or something, and and I'd hear the uh, worship music uh, coming through the windows on a Sunday on a Sunday morning, and I it kind of felt like I was being serenaded by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> in a in in a way. I think I I think I I think I shared that with you uh, in in, a, in, a, in an email, Justin, and then uh, I went to a uh, we went to a Christmas service, and uh, I was blown away by um, the. Um, by the story on the big screen, just simply of the Virgin Mary trying to find a birth for, uh, you know, a birthplace for uh, her, um, her child. And it really resonated with me very, very strongly. And, and, and things were already starting to change. And we found ourselves back at uh, the same church the following Sunday. It was my first introduction to modern uh, worship music. You know, I, I, I grew up as a, as a, as a, as a, Christmas Catholic, you could say. I, uh, my family weren't particularly uh, religion. I uh, religious. I had no real real influence there. And for the first time in my life, I, I started to hear, uh, you know, Christ described in ways that I'd never experienced before. So, ex- for example, he was described as as beautiful and lovely, and I'd never heard God described like this before um, because. I, I read theology at university, and it was very intellectual. And he'd been um, defined as the unmoved mover or the primal cause, you know, the primal cause mm. in, in this type of language. And uh, I, really, there was a softening in my heart that took place. And a couple of other things I'd like to um, to share um, to share with you. Uh, I remember when I was um, trading with my business that I built up alongside. Um, teaching yoga, although I was really teaching yoga less and less by this stage, and uh, I I was uh, at the Mind Body Spirit Festival in in in, in London, 
And um, there was a Christian organization in this kind of sea of new age um, traders and, and, and businesses, etc. And I'd already really started to notice a, a, a huge transformation that had occurred right from the, the, the right from the center of me. And uh, I remember I, I found myself at this um, stall, this Christian organization, and uh, I, I just said to this woman who was working there that um, you know that um, Jesus had died on the cross for the give, for the forgiveness of my sins and was raised from the dead and uh, and uh, on the third day, and it was it was uh, it was testimony that I had shared for the first time and I shared this with a friend as well, and I just knew that um, this was a, a radically new um, position that I had come to. Um, and I knew that I had received in this time, you know, the, 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 the grace of, um, you know, the grace of Jesus Christ. And uh, another key influence on this journey was uh, also, you know, my, my partner, my wife. And um, she did an alpha course. Um, and I noticed how her behavior and how she started to change as well. And... Uh, if I might be candid and share another part of our life as well, we were having problems conceive, conceiving, and we waited for many, many years uh, for our for our first baby um, to come along. And uh, we knew that um, you know we were accepted, even though I was a yoga teacher with open arms in my local church. Um, there were people in that time praying for us, and um, my wife came back. Um, one day and, and she said that she was deep in prayer traveling back on the train um, and she was in a state because of the situation of you know us not being able to conceive and she heard a voice in her head which she said was God giving her the name Nathan and she thought to herself well you know I don't know anyone called Nathan uh, what what does Nathan what does Nathaniel mean and it means God has given so uh we 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 named our son. That's his uh, um, second name after this um, uh, after this occurrence. And uh, you know, my, my my wife isn't the kind of person who has these types of experiences. You know, she's very rational. But she said that God had spoken to her, yeah. and and I know that God speaks to to people. I I know that. So that was uh, really instructive yeah. and. Um, so I kept on having experiences like that, and that was wow. It. I, I mean, obviously, th this has led you to the point, obviously, where where you, you were able to call yourself a Christian. Um, we'll come back in just a moment's time to where this has led you in terms of your relationship with yoga now, and and then we'll obviously get Mike's input on this as well because I think I think there's there, there's such an interesting overlap between your stories, but also, as I say, some differences in the way you you now approach this this whole subject. And we'll of course be asking: Should Christians partake practice yoga in the rest of the show as well so um hope you enjoy this I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing the stories but we'll get into the rest of today's show as we uh, continue the discussion between my guests mike shreve and chris james you're listening to unbelievable we'll be back soon in an increasingly secular and skeptical world it can often feel like faith is under threat but faith isn't simply blind belief it's trusting in something we have good evidence for I believe that in recent years, Christianity has undergone a revival of its intellectual tradition, and a new generation of believers is emerging, equipped to engage the world with all of their heart, soul, and mind for Jesus. My name's Justin Briley, and I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, an apologetics course from Unbelievable and Premier that will help you to understand the evidence for God and answer objections to faith. Welcome back to today's show. Um, we're talking about yoga here on Unbelievable today, and it's a phenomenally popular form of exercise and meditation all over the world. Um, but should Christians take part in it? Well, two Christians with different perspectives on this joining me on the show today. Mike Shreve has told us about his conversion experience, radical conversion, um, as a sort of, you know, someone very much into New Age philosophy, uh, seeking, you know, enlightenment uh, in the in the late 60s. But he really put yoga behind him, having been a, a quite advanced practitioner after this experience of becoming a Christian. Chris James, um, who we've been hearing from, has also been on a journey towards Christ in recent years. 
he still though practices um yoga to a certain degree and we'll we'll come to some of the differences that mike and chris have on this front in, in a moment's time uh, mike what why for you though um was it so important for you to completely if you like um forego any kind of yoga um you disavow really even the the, the physical practice of yoga now don't you Right. I, I do believe that there are Christian alternatives that do not use the word yoga because words have power and words have associations in people's minds. And I like to compare it to this. When I pray now as a Christian, I want to transcend the natural world and come into the presence of God. And when I pray, I normally meditate as well. But I believe there's a vast difference between Christian meditation and Hindu or Buddhist meditation or other uh, religions that practice that. However, because I want to transcend and because I include meditation in my prayer time, I would never call it transcendental meditation because there's a connotation of that that automatically associates it with a Far Eastern worldview uh, that was, of course, promoted by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And uh, I'm very familiar with what he taught. So just the use of the word yoga, maybe it doesn't have that effect on me, but it has that effect on other people. They associate it with the entire worldview that's normally attached to it. And uh, I have other reasons that uh, I believe it's important. Now, uh, since I'm camped on that, I might mention 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where Paul was talking about food offered to idols. And you should read the whole chapter to get the full gist of it. But in essence, he said, the idol is nothing. The idol doesn't exist. And if it's been offered to an idol... You can pray over it and it will be all right. However, he said, if someone weak in the faith sees you do that, or someone outside the faith for that matter, they may think you're doing it in honor of that idol. And so you've damaged that person's faith or you've damaged their view of what Christianity is. And of course, I'm paraphrasing what Paul said in that chapter. And so he said, I'll never eat meat again like that if I would hinder someone else in their walk. And that's the way I feel, uh, or that's one of the reasons I feel it would be necessary for me as a Christian to separate myself from yoga altogether, because I have that filter. I could probably get in a couple of those positions and do some exercises that would be beneficial to my body. But if I'm publicly doing it or in yoga classes or in some type of studio setting and I'm doing yoga, then someone might think, well, Mike Shree must think that the whole philosophy, the philosophical view of yoga is legitimate because they associate the whole with a part. And so I, I feel like it's important just to separate yourself for the cause of not influencing others negatively. That's a very interesting way of putting it. Chris, how much do you agree with that? And, and what's your current practice as regards yoga? Right. So uh, I, I agree with much of what Mike has said, uh, but my, um, I don't actually practice yoga anymore. Um, I think essentially uh, yoga is a different worldview to um, the Christian faith, and it's a little bit like trying to mix oil and water. They just don't mix, uh, and, and that's all there is to it. Um, that said, I, I still enjoy a good stretch, <laughs> uh, and um, I enjoy the feeling um, that this um, gives in my, in my body and in, in my mind in terms of uh, feeling relaxed, etc. But what I don't do when I'm stretching is I don't incorporate mantra, um, chanting, um, you know, Vedic chanting or anything like that. Not that I really ever did. And I tend not to incorporate anything which is kind of, uh, how can you say, and anything, any philosophical underpinning from uh, the, the yoga tradition. Um, 
I think I think it is um, possible, although I wouldn't teach it. I think it is possible to isolate uh, the physical movements and to um, practice them in within a therapeutic context. So, for example, if I just did the movements and combined uh, the isometric movements with with breath, then uh, I will um, feel that you know my body is stretched or work on my tensile tissue. It'll be good for my lower back. It will soften my shoulders. Uh, and um, I will feel more relaxed because I have engaged with the um, rest and relaxation response um, in my nervous system. But kind of that's that's as far as it that's as far as it goes. I would never uh, do anything now that I feel would con conflict with my faith. So you never uh, participate in a yoga studio setting or go to yoga no. classes. No, no, I haven't been to yoga class for a very long time, actually. Well, see, that's, yes. no, I wouldn't. That's, that's one of my main areas of concern. I believe in something called transfer of spirits also. And I know that I receive demonic influence through sitting under Yogi Bhajan. And if Christians go to yoga classes and the yoga teacher is a certified yoga teacher. I don't know what certification process you go through in the UK, but here in the US, it's, or rather you're in Australia and you're in, U in the UK, Justin. Uh, but in the US, they go usually, not always, but usually go through a group called Yoga Alliance. And if you go to Yoga Alliance's website, in order to get your certification, you have to do a certain number of hours of studying for instance, mantra yoga or other practices that are definitely uh, an introduction to Hinduism. In fact, I had a friend who went for yoga certification and she was a Christian and uh, she was going through different classes and she had to go to the class on mantras. And the one leading the class, who's a very famous yoga practitioner, uh, asked the whole class to chant a certain mantra with him. And everyone did except her. And she walked up to him afterward, not confrontationally, just matter of factly. And she said, I can't chant unless I know the meaning of that chant, that mantra. And he said, well, that chant means I give my soul to Shiva. And she said, I've got to leave. And so uh, she left uh, uh, that uh, certification process altogether. Later on, she started her own group called Holy Fit, W-H-O-L-Y-F-I-T, Holy Fit. And uh, they still use the low impact exercise regimen that's similar to yoga, but they don't call it yoga and they don't associate with yoga whatsoever. And she doesn't claim certification because if you go to a yoga class and someone claims to be a registered yoga teacher certified through Yoga Alliance, you know that they're mixing and compromising their belief systems because many of them who claim to be Christian still believe in the chakras and meditating on the chakras. And according to that philosophy, every chakra is dedicated to a different Hindu deity. And if you believe in the chakras, you have to believe in the Kundalini. And the Kundalini I is the serpent power. Yes, Justin. Well, I want to I want to come back to some of your experiences yourself on that sort of spiritual, even demonic sort of aspect that you believe there is to that. But Chris, just coming back to you, um, do you, I mean, Mike believes in that sense that the phrase Christian yoga is an oxymoron. Um, if if you're doing yoga, you're you can't be. But I mean, do you think it, 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 do you think the same way? I mean, it should should Christians, if they're doing stretching exercises, call it that rather than calling it yoga? Should it be dissociated entirely from 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 that 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 phrase? Uh, I, I think you really, if you're, I think you should really go into the practice with your eyes very wide open. Uh, I, I think I think Christian yoga is an oxymoron. I, 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 oxymoron. I, I I really do. Um, as I as I said earlier, um, it's like trying to mix oil and water. Um, I just don't think the two worldviews can can be mixed. But my point really was earlier that um, if you can extrapolate the purely um, physical movement and divorce it from its philosophical underpinning, from 
uh, uh, for, you know, from the mantras, from saying the mantras, from using the mudras, the the, the hand gestures, etc., uh, in your own way, then um, then then I I, I I I think that you can just do the physical movements. But you know, if you just do the physical movements, then really you have to ask the question: um, Should we really be calling this yoga? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be calling it yoga because um, actually a lot of the yoga poses that people practice in their gyms and and uh you know wellness centers or whatever um come through that um tradition that i spoke about earlier that i referred to earlier which is the krishnamacharya tradition and actually this um this brahman this um guy krishnamacharya actually borrowed um, a lot of the movements from observing western gymnasts in the Mysore Palace in the 1930s. So really, by the time you're practicing, um, you know, the movements in a in a in a in a in a Western yoga class setting, it's it's it, it is a real um, how can you say um, uh, um, a very small part of the uh, original practice. But actually, I do agree with Mike. I think there are some dangers. I think there are some dangers. And I think that there are more dangers in certain forms of yoga that are practiced. So, for example, I think with Mike's journey was around kundalini yoga, which I think is a particularly insidious um, yeah. form of, of yoga. It comes from a, v- a Vedic tradition. Um, I used to warn my students, even when I was a teacher, I used to warn them against the practice of anything to do with Kundalini right. because I think it I think it is incredibly dangerous. It is. And, and, and I think I think the reasons that Michael share in just a moment uh, uh, are quite uh, yes, quite um, satanic. Uh, the, the the practice of Kundalini. There's no doubt in my mind. You you say that the the, the phrase Kundalini might comes from the word for serpent so tell us about some of your experiences I, I i believe you believe you did experience a demonic attack not long after this conversion experience of yours uh yeah i, I certainly did shortly after i was converted and left all my classes and shut down my ashram uh, i was laying in bed one night and just reading the bible and i had a warning from some more mature christians that the spirit I had been delivered from, they had prayed deliverance over me. They said that spirit may come back to try and re-inhabit you. Because Jesus even talked about that. When the unclean spirit leaves a person, he goes through dry places and finding no rest, he comes back with seven times worse spirits to try and re-inhabit the original vessel. So anyway, I was laying in bed one night and reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, I saw a cloudy uh, entity about the size of a large grapefruit or a a little smaller than a volleyball. uh, And it came through the wall and rushed across the room and slammed into my forehead and began to try and suck my soul out of my body. And intuitively, I realized in a split second that was the demon I'd yielded to when I did Kundalini yoga. And I had astral projection experiences back then that now I believe were completely delusionary and deceptive. But uh, I knew that if if I somehow was overwhelmed or overcome by this spirit, that it would get me out of my body and I would never get back in again. And there are thousands of people in India that are locked in a catatonic type of state mentally, because they they went into meditation and never came out. And so I, I had this fear that this is what this demon was going to try and do to me. Thankfully, I remembered one of the people that won me to the Lord in the beginning and, and prayed over me in the beginning, said, if you ever have a confrontation with the demon spirit, claim the blood of Jesus. And so I was paralyzed. I couldn't open my mouth. But in my mind, I, I thought the blood of Jesus be upon you, the blood of Jesus be upon you. And about the third time I thought it, that spirit pulled back and was hovering there. And I know it sounds weird and strange and outlandish to a lot of people, but it was like it was bristling with anger toward me and hatred toward me. And then I could speak 
And I said, the blood of Jesus be upon you. I rebuke you from this room. And it fled. And it has never been back in that manifest way since. And I get phone calls from people all around the world that are having kundalini manifestations where they feel energy surges through their body, some on the brink of insanity because they can't control it. And we pray deliverance over that. I prayed over a yo former yoga advocate um, just two days ago from Japan. I had to have an interpreter. And she was plagued with these senses, these feelings of energy surges through her body, which were demonic in origin. But through the proclamation of the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the word of God, she was delivered. And, uh, and so it is possible. And that's part of the reason why I just feel it's safer to separate altogether. And, and these Christian groups that have offered a Christian alternative, one thing I agree with them about, and I'm, t I'm not talking about Christian yoga, I'm talking about uh, low impact physical exercise regimens that use movement like that. They do not attribute any spiritual power to the movements because when you do, that becomes witchcraft. And strangely, the guru I studied under called yoga white witchcraft. He said there's three forms of witchcraft. Black witchcraft is utilizing spiritual power for evil purposes Red witchcraft is utilizing spiritual power for selfish purposes, but white witchcraft is utilizing spiritual power for noble purposes. And, of course, he was teaching us how to be white witches, therefore. Well, the Bible doesn't differentiate between black and red and white witchcraft. All witchcraft is outlawed in Deuteronomy 18. And witchcraft is illegitimate spiritual power or spiritual power that is divorced from a relationship with the true God. And so I would dare to say that it may sound uh, unreceivable to a lot of people, but yoga at its base is witchcraft because it taps into spiritual power that does not come from God. What, what's your view on this, Chris? Do you, do you share those kinds of significant concerns? I mean, obviously, when you were practicing yoga, you I presume you never had any of these sort of spiritual slash demonic even experiences but do you do you recognize that there was a danger in in what you were practicing and, and passing on do you I, do you regret you know your time as as a yoga teacher in that sense i don't think i regret my time uh, as a as a yoga teacher um at all actually in fact what i did notice is that when i uh, started to um uh, you know come to come to christ uh, that I did notice um, that quite a few of my friends in the yoga community, um, etc., for no explicable reason, actually come to Christ too at the same time, and uh, they, uh, I could see them in, at at the services that I, that, you know, that I was at in, in in the church across the road from me. So that was quite extraordinary um, that I could be uh, that you know. Um, that my teacher could be, or well, my reputation as a teacher could be a positive influence. So I, I don't think I, I don't think I regret it. Um, I don't think that I, I ever consider myself as a type of priest um, in that world, and I don't think that anyone um, really would consider that, um, you know, being licensed to uh, being a teacher, let's say, under the uh, system in in the UK. I'm not familiar with the system in um, Australia so much. But I, I, I am aware that there is a real danger with uh, Kundalini type experiences. And uh, as I mentioned beforehand, that I really did um, you know, warn my students um, a, a, a away from this type of practice. And I was, uh, you know, very, um, you know, I was very sure about that. And what I do know is that um, a lot of people in mental institutions in the West have had Kundalini type experiences that have been undiagnosed uh, by um, psychiatrists and psychologists because they don't have necessarily have a paradigm that uh, can, can cope with that type of uh, um, experience. Hmm. I, I, I guess, I guess my question is then for you in a way, Chris is if someone is, 
doing yoga primarily in that sort of that that tradition you were coming from which which is really a, a westernized form and which is really about the exercises the low impact you know exercises and so on perhaps really not doing anything around mantras or or, or you know worshiping chakras or anything else do, i mean would your advice still be to say best left alone at this point or would you say well no as long as it's not these more extreme forms you know uh, the kundalini form and so on the what where would you fall on that right now would you say would you your would your counsel still be don't don't do it um i I think my counsel would be very very gentle um to start off with because i think all of these practitioners you know are, are are looking for something and um there is um you know a real suggestibility because i i think that uh, mike and i were speaking a little bit beforehand in this program that there, there is like a spiritual vacuum in the west you know that has been filled by uh, people going to india etc and and uh, receiving treat uh, um you know teaching from a variety of metaphysical tramps uh, uh for example who pray on the suggestibility of um you know uh the westerners load etc uh but i think i really would say to people who are practicing yoga that uh, i i'd start to ask them questions about you know where does all this where does all this end up you know what's the, what's the what's the end goal what are you what are you doing this for um and i think a lot of people who are practicing yoga just do not do yoga for spiritual reasons at all they do it because um they've seen the physical benefits i I've, i've taught rugby players and uh, you know professional athletes iron men for example in the past because it helps to you know to condition their bodies uh and they have no interest really in 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 the spiritual side of things but really um at this level i i really would call it yoga because you're not really uh using any mantras or any philosophical underpinning you can call it something else you can just call it intelligent movement for example um but you know i would welcome those sorts of conversations with people who perhaps a little more down the line who are more interested in the spiritual side of, of, of yoga i'd certainly um have a conversation uh, with these people i don't know well, if that made any I, sense well it does it makes a lot of sense and i'd be interested in mike as we move into this you know what your approach is um i mean it's interesting chris mentioned the the mind body fair um which uh takes place in london um every year i went several years ago now to that to do a radio feature and it was on behalf of a group that may have been the same group chris uh, a christian group that rather than waving placards outside you know saying isn't this terrible decided let's go in and we will kind of be a christian presence uh not condemning necessarily the the other stands that were around them but but inviting people to experience jesus that is sort of as an alternative to the the other you know eastern traditions yeah. and, and there are different ways in which people reach out in that sense to the new age community uh to you know to, to eastern influence mystic mysticism and so on what's your counsel on this mike is is it you know do you think there is a sort of place at which christians can be sort of gently moving people as as chris calls it rather than condemning them i suppose for for what they're practicing in that sense when i'm witnessing to a yoga advocate i don't bring out some of the things i brought out on this program because i know it would immediately cause a a, a resistance uh because as chris said most people involved in yoga are seekers they're they're reaching out for something better in life whether it's physical well-being or mental well-being and so i don't treat people as if they're the quote unquote enemy because they embrace that particular world view there's entry points into people's lives where you can find something that applies to them that appeals to them and you don't have to get someone to accept everything you believe in order to receive jesus but if you can take them to one thing that they can accept then it works but on my website the truelight.net for instance i i do have a lot of articles that i think appeal to people that are of a new age mindset 
or a Far Eastern mindset, but I also draw some very definitive lines. For instance, one of my most popular articles on the truelight.net was uh, an article I put just a few weeks ago called 10 Yoga Poses That Offer Worship to Hindu Deities. And a lot of people don't realize that the poses and the mudras are all connected to various gods and goddesses. And sometimes they imitate a certain story about that god or goddess or are an invocation to that god or goddess to manifest in their lives. Just to give you a few examples, for instance, the tree pose, which is standing on one leg and lifting the other foot to uh, the inside calf, I guess, or next to the knee, is dedicated to Vishnu. And the dancer pose is dedicated to Shiva. And Shiva, in fact, is the god of destruction in Hinduism and is called the Lord of Yoga. Shiva, the god of destruction, is called the Lord of Yoga, which immediately would make me want to recoil from the use of that word altogether. Because, uh, of course, I don't believe in Shiva. I believe the quote-unquote god of destruction is Satan. And uh, and he's not a god in the sense that a Hindu would use that word. But uh, uh, the standing pose is dedicated to Krishna. The uh, splits pose is dedicated to the monkey god, Hanuman. And uh, and so I, you can go to the article and, and see all of the poses depicted and the gods they're dedicated to. And my concern is if someone is in a yoga class, and they're not interested in becoming a Hindu. They're not interested in embracing the worldview behind it. But they're in an atmosphere where these things are honored. Then that's going to be a connection with the spiritual realm. If they sit cross-legged and, and use this mudra with their hands resting on their knees, that mudra is a prayerful statement. The finger represents Atman, which is the individual soul. The thumb represents Brahman, which is the oversoul or uh, universal consciousness, an impersonal life force, not a personal God. But in Hinduism, Brahman is conceived to be ultimate reality. And to put your finger, your forefinger to your thumb like that is an invocation to Brahman to fully manifest in you so that you arrive at God consciousness. When uh, yoga devotees uh, greet each other, they often say namaste and fold their hands, which is a very beautiful, humble, meek way of greeting each other on the surface. But the meaning behind it is I bow to the divine in you. Or in other words, I recognize that you are God in manifestation. And of course, that's the antithesis of the truth, sure. according to the Bible. We'll come back to this in a moment. I'm I'm going to draw draw it short there, just just because we're we're reaching the end of t this segment, and we'll we'll come back. Um, we're talking about yoga on the program today. Mike Shreve and uh, Chris James join me today. Fascinating discussion. I've learned so much in the course of of hearing from you both, gentlemen, and some really really interesting stories along the way too. Um, we we're going to sort of conclude this part of the conversation though on. Um, how Christians uh, can reach out to those engaged in yoga, new age practices and so on in just a moment's time. Uh, you're listening to Unbelievable. We'll be back soon. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Welcome back to the final part of this week's edition of the show. We've been discussing yoga um, from two, you know, quite similar positions, but people who have some differences in, in the way it's worked out in their lives. Um, two former yoga instructors, uh, Mike Shreve's journey goes back some way uh, to his conversion in the early 70s. Um, Chris James more recently come to faith, having been one of the UK's leading um, yoga teachers. Um, and it's been so helpful kind of for you both to draw out for both of you what you consider the kind of the lines between the sort of the benefits of the exercise and the the actual spiritual dimension of yoga um uh, we, we were talking there in that last section chris about how you can fruitfully reach out to people in the the new age community and and so on i think there is you know as you said there is a real desire um i don't um for people to to find something beyond just the material world isn't there and to that extent I can see why, um, you know, ever since, you know, the 60s, 
the new the new age eastern kind of movements have been so popular they're a kind of alternative to the sort of materialistic west in a way but at the same time um you know we live in an age where you know we're increasingly distracted uh stressed out anxious mindfulness has become a really big buzzword hasn't it and i see um mindfulness all over the place and in christian circles as well so what I mean, how given given that yoga does seem so well placed uh, to to speak to that need in people, it's very understandable why it would be do, having something of a probably revival at the moment. Those those sorts of practices. What what can Christianity offer though? Because I think probably the the problem often is that people don't feel like Christianity really speaks to that kind of issue of meditation and mindfulness. Um, do do you think that's a problem? Do do Christians need to kind of win that ground back somewhat from, you know, the, the Eastern religions and yoga and so on? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I, I think actually, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Christian meditation, for example, I, I think it, uh, it, 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 there is a really big opportunity there for, uh, for, for more work to be done in this space. Uh, because uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, it's become so much more popular uh, meditation and mindfulness. There, there is a, a difference between meditation and mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is uh, um, kind of like it's, it's meditation, but without the religion and philosophy. And mindfulness is is used within um, psychology circles, uh, for example, to uh, uh, for, for various different reasons, for various different therapies, etc. Um, I think um, yes, uh, Christian meditation is very interesting because. Um, Christians, you know, in the patristic period, um, practiced, uh, went out into the desert, the, you know, the patristic fathers went out there into the desert to, um, uh, to meditate on the, uh, on, 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 on Christ and, uh, you know, the, 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 the reality of Christ and uh, who Christ was, uh, you know, in, 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 in their life, etc. And the truth of the Christian story, um, for example. Um, but I think that there could be a danger because, uh, perhaps people are turning to a more Eastern form of uh, meditation, uh, which really focuses on um, emptying the mind right. uh, for the purpose of emptying the mind itself, rather than on a point of scripture, for example. So um, I think that there could be, um, in a sense, that I, I understand uh, Christians are concerned about this, that... Um, you know, when you when you meditate, you open yourself up to uh, you know to other forces, uh, because in its essence, uh, meditation mean, means the the emptying of the mind. Whereas I think really Christian meditation is a much uh, safer um, practice because at least you can pra uh, you can meditate on scripture, for example, uh, and uh, you'd still have the benefits of uh, peace of mind, etc than other kind of, you know, more Eastern uh, forms of meditation have. What, yeah, what, what's your view on this, Mike? Well, uh, I believe if meditation is too mechanical or monotone or mundane or mystical or magical in the way it's explained, it's wrong. 99% of the time it's wrong because meditation biblically is relational. It's pausing the rush of your mind to focus on the Word of God and to prayerfully converse with God about the meaning of His Word and to wait on impulses coming from the Holy Spirit to your heart. So it's very relational in its basis. While mindfulness is really uh, a misnomer because you're not... Your mind is not full. Your mind, as you said, Chris, is really empty. That's the goal. And sometimes uh, people will use different methods like staring at a dot on the wall or staring at a flame on a candle. Anything to become completely focused to a spot or a thing in order to shut everything else out. Now, I do believe if you do that, if you get rid of what Easterners call the monkey chatter in your mind, that you're going to experience a semblance of peace. It's not going to be the peace of God. It will be a soulish kind of peace. 
but you will feel the calming of your mind, which all of us need, right? But there's a much, much greater peace when it's the peace of God that comes through conversing with the Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, it's Sar Shalom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the main ways of meditating that I practiced as a yoga teacher was mantra yoga and mantra meditation. And we would chant a Hindu series of words like Ekonkar Satnam Siriwa Guru and over and over and over in a monotone way because supposedly uh, the more we did it thousands, tens of thousands of times, we would merge with ultimate reality, which was conceptualized as being God. Well, wait just a second. Uh, does God receive that kind of approach? In his first main sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself, he, he pinpointed that practice with this statement. He said, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do, for they believe that they'll be heard for their much speaking. Well, why would it be wrong to chant something in a monotone way over and over again? Because you would never approach a fellow human being that way. Uh, I was getting to know Chris before our conversation. And what if I'd repeated the same seven word statement about a hundred times? He would have said, hey, Justin, we got to get rid of this guy. He's nuts. <laughs> you, know? you would never... You would never communicate with a fellow human being that way. So why would we think the God who is a super intelligent God, far more intelligent than us, would receive that kind of approach? Uh, he doesn't because it's too mechanical and, and it's too manipulative because the meditator believes that when he chants that mantra, he can direct the energy, uh, which... Hindus call prana, and uh, Taoists call chi, uh, that you can control and direct that energy, which is conce conceived to be God, but it's not God. Chris, I mean, I, I can see you nod nodding away to a lot of that, uh, and it it's been great in a way to, to have a show where there's been so much, you know, common ground between you both. I mean, when, when it comes ultimately, though, to a person who, who is looking for peace, who is looking for enlightenment, um, some you know just wants to transcend in a sense the the materialism and so on of of the world we live in what would you say christianity can give someone in that scenario what wh where would you direct them if you like if not to their local yoga class why you know would you be directing them to your local church is that a, a satisfactory place in all honesty to find the kind of meaning and transcendence that that people are looking for well i think certainly with um my church where I used to live in London, uh, because there are all sorts of outreach groups. Uh, I think as a church, it had about 80 or 90 outreach groups into the community. Um, and one of those outreach groups was a, a Bible group, um, which was a men's Bible group, which I became a part of in around about the year 2015 and 2016. And we were a motley crew of uh, um, individuals used to meet on a Tuesday night. We call ourselves the Fishers of Men. Um, and uh, we, we looked at scripture and uh, we prayed together, etc. And I was really um, embraced, not just by these guys, but by the whole church, actually, um, you know, despite what I was doing for a living. In fact, we were welcome. Uh, my, my wife and I was uh, with open arms. So I think really, uh, you know, to... If, if people who are interested in, in yoga really are looking for spiritual reasons, then, then I, I would challenge them and, and the, try to challenge them in the most gentle of ways, just to say, actually, what you're looking for, um, you're not going to find within the uh, yoga tradition. You're, you're, you're not going to find it there. Really, if you're looking for the peace of God, then... Uh, you know, you, you, you have to um, look in a different direction, you know, uh, in, the, in the direction that I've just um, spoken about. But that was that was a very important, uh, that was a really important channel for me. Yeah, a really important channel. It's, it's been great having both of you on today. Any, any final thoughts, Mike, as we close out today's show? Well, I would just say to 
anyone listening who might not be a Christian yet, something that the man who won me to the Lord said several times, because uh, as Chris was implying, as he taught that in the beginning, uh, in that transitional period where he and his wife were becoming Christians, there were some things that they were still holding on to that maybe you've divested uh, by this time in your life. And you're not going to be able to feed a steak to a baby. You have to bring them a little bit at a time into the faith. And so the man who won me to the Lord would not get in an argument over doctrine. Uh, I told him, I said, listen, I'll never believe the Bible is God's inspired word. And he'd just smile at me and say, don't worry about that. Try Jesus. And I'd say, well... There's some things about the Bible that I don't believe. And I enumerated some things. And he said, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. I said, well, there's a belief that I hold to now that I will absolutely never give up. I believe in reincarnation. I believe that the soul will reincarnate hundreds, thousands of times on its journey to perfection. He said, don't worry about that either. Just try Jesus. Because he knew if I found Jesus and if I encountered him in a real uh, born again experience, that those beliefs would get adjusted and that the spirit of truth would be in me because you can't, you can't convince someone who hasn't been born again of all the beliefs of Christianity yet. So you have to find an entrance. You have to find a way of befriending them. People call it friend evangelism. And some people befriended you, Chris, and and they didn't hammer at. See, a lot of people get into the new age, Justin, because they're tired of being hammered with a harsh kind of Christianity. And so I think being loving and patient and gentle is important, not at the expense of compromising the word of God, but recognizing that people grow sometimes a little at a time and we have to be patient with them. But I would invite anyone listening to just try Jesus. Ask him to come to you like I did. Dedicate a day to him. Ask him to reveal himself. And he will. He said, him that comes to me, I will not cast away. And so, uh, and I, I have lots of testimonies of former yoga people on our website that I mentioned a while ago. And so I, I would encourage people to come and read those testimonies. And these are people that were in yoga 20, 30, 40 years of their lives and, and studied under the most recognized yoga masters in the world and yet became Christians. And so there's got to yeah. be something there that would change them. Well, it, it's just been a fascinating discussion with you both. Thank you, Chris and Mike, for being my guests on the show today. Uh, if you want more from both Mike and Chris, I'll make sure there are links with today's show. Do go and check out their, their books and websites. Um, but for now, um, thank you for being with me on the program. What a privilege. What a blessing. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Good to meet you, Mike. Good to meet you, Chris. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.